This webinar is all about building a better product at 100x rate of delivery by becoming UI UX led. Uh, and this is highly important now more than ever. In fact, if you want to get ahead of your competitors, uh, there's no better time than right now in the, both in the economic downturn and the fact that there's some nuances that you should be focusing on in terms of how other companies are falling behind. Uh, and this is very prevalent in my both in my experiences and the sentiment shared uh, across the globe in the tech space. Uh, tech companies are still building, are stuck building the old way. And we were there not too long ago. Um, so a few yet powerful techniques are going to turn things over for you guys with your businesses and how you lead your teams from design to development production. And of course, that's going to affect your bottom line. If you can build with minimal resources at breakneck speed, you will, of course, surpass your competitors. Uh, and this is what we're going to be speaking about today. So guys, tune in, focus right up. It's really important. I'm going to be going pretty fast uh, to get to the end of the session. Uh, and we'll, uh, and yeah, and just, and make sure that you do stay focused. So grab a drink, get con get cozy, and we'll get start. We'll get straight away, get started straight away. Um, okay. First things first agenda. So I'll be covering for the most part, the, uh, the product led side. So how to essentially use our framework to build at hundred X rate delivery. Now hundred X rate delivery, by the way, is not just a fluffy term or, uh, or kind of number that we picked out of, out of thin air. It, it literally is the rate of delivery we've been able to experience after fixing our UIX process ourselves as a SaaS company. Um, and so this is, this is where you guys, anyone uh, uh, using this framework will be able to achieve the same results, if not close to it. Uh, but I'll be covering that this this uh, this this topic, and uh, at the end, you you guys should be sticking around to the end because we'll be sharing our framework for free, where you can utilize this in practice internally with your team. Uh, and so we'll be sharing that out for free at the end. So do stick around till the end. We're going to give you the whole context of how the framework actually works and how you can deliver it internally. And you'll also get practical steps um, with, with in the form of a template that you can apply internally. And Mark Pearson will be uh, covering how to prep your startup for VC funding in an economic downturn. And a lot of these... Um, the the kind of uh, the uh, the points that he'll mention will also be totally relevant for you guys whether you're pursuing funding or not. It's it's more than it's more important than ever to utilize these um, uh, these methodologies to make your business more lean and more uh, focus on your existing users or to get initial traction so you can succeed in the market. So whether or not you're pursuing funding, it's highly relevant for for you. So do stick around till the end for that session, and then finally we'll, we'll end with a Q and A. All right, so we've got a super valuable pack session today. Hopefully within an hour, I'll try to keep it within an hour. And that's my promise to you guys. I promise by the end of this, um, you'll have the framework that you need to, to build at a much faster rate. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been privileged to be exposed to the right people in the right environment. Uh, and hence, that's where I've kind of gained a lot of experience in the tech space. Uh, I would say my curiosity and passion in tech has led me to achieve the following, which is I've built four SaaS products in the last three years. I've invested close to $200,000 on UI UX design alone, leading these product teams um, and leading product teams for the past six years, in fact, and currently coaching 10 companies on their UI UX processes to optimize those things to uh, improve the delivery. And something really relevant about myself is I'm building a design tool, glorify.com, in fact, which Mark Pearson invested in very recently. Uh, Fuel Ventures led the round there. And why is this relevant? Because UI UX alone with a design tool is, is extremely the main, it's, it firstly is extremely important, but it's also the main differentiator when you want to compete in the market. If you look at the design tool space, um, all the design tools have one market share through UI UX alone. Essentially, the output is still the same, but through UI UX nuances, they've been able to position themselves for uh, different users, right? And it's also extremely behavioral. You know, users are accustomed to certain workflows, certain layouts, or where a certain user patterns to access tools. And so those um, nuances are really important for myself and our product team to pay attention to when building the product. Uh, the UX is also extremely complex. It's on, in fact, on the technology side, it is rated as the more highest in complexity um, in terms of tech stack and also how the kind of the functionality works from both back end and front end. And because of those things, the, these things, building a design tool in the past three years has given me uh, a lot of depth in terms of uh, optimizing the UI UX process. But also it's important to point out that 
UI and UX, uh, differential UI UX uh, alone is nothing new. This has been done over and over again uh, in the past, um, you know, multiple decades, in fact, right? So it's it's no new story. You've seen this with MailChimp and ConvertKit, uh, email delivery platforms where MailChimp has been primarily focused on businesses and ConvertKit primarily focused on the, uh, on, a, on, on creators, on the creators market, people, um, you know, that need to monetize their blog or vloggers or content creators. You've seen this in inter -message, interpersonal messaging platforms such as Discord and Slack. This is highly co um, um, uh, common where you'll notice like the, the again, the UI UX is very differentiated for, com in, in the case of Discord, it's targeted towards communities and Slack is targeted towards businesses. So team members can stay in, in contact with each other. You also notice the same uh, pattern in uh, the web building platforms uh, where Webflow, for example, is targeted towards a professional market. You'll notice that they target both coders and professional designers to use no code web building uh, tools to do the heavy lifting for them. And Wix on the other side will focus on uh, you know, delivering much more drag and drop, easy to use tools for the DIY market. So the important point to drive home here is that UI UX, differentiating on UI UX alone uh, has been done before and uh, it shows the importance of UI UX. You can actually get market share by just, uh, and success and win alone with UI UX. The question that I want to pose today is UI UX underrated. And my argument today is that it is highly underrated. Uh, and the reasons being is because this field UI UX has evolved so much in just the last two years alone. Uh, in fact, it's evolved tenfold if you look at uh, historically, and we're going to touch on that in a moment. But just in the last three years or two years, uh, Figma's evolution and the features that they've been able to release and the kind of pivot in the market share in terms of you know the, the, the tools and the processes, uh, is really interesting to see how much it has evolved and how much uh, how much has changed. And this has impacted how people are delivering products. And you'll notice this in a moment. But because of the gap of knowledge, this is why my, my belief is that UX is highly underrated. Is Do people value it? Do people know that it's important? Of course. And I won't take that away from any tech founder today. Everyone knows that UI UX is fundamental and a pillar in their business pipeline. But it's still underrated because they don't uh, the the processes uh, have not uh, been um, uh, uh, transferred in terms of the 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 the, the new the latest knowledge, for example. Um, so if I go look at the 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 UI UX, um, if if you look at the pipeline of production, the UI UX workflow starts uh, at the right right at the beginning, and this is fundamental to every milestone in your business. So it affects, impacts everything that you do afterwards from your product development, uh, the code that you finally ship to your end users. This of, of course uh, affects your, your um, product delivery. It affects your growth milestones. In fact, UI UX is the biggest bottleneck towards progress. If you don't optimize this process, you're gonna have, it's gonna be hugely impactful on uh, your, your growth goals and growth targets. And one of the reasons that UI UX is underrated is going back to this problem of product leaders not being informed about uh, the unoptimized process and the more modern process. Um, this is where it starts and people are kind of stuck in this older system where product leaders are not informed. They are really the problem. UI UX designers and creative directors are working in a bubble, bubble or a silo, uh, you know, to their own devices in their subjective thought processes and not really collaborating in that holistic environment. And it's for no fault of their own. You find that product uh, builders and, and product leadership teams, they're kind of focused on growth goals, growth milestones and things like that. And really it's sort of, the, the workflow is more of a, a handed request, you know, just sub submitting, you know, this is the, our, this, these are our targets, these are our goals and the designers deliver. The designers might have the knowledge of creating scalable design systems and robust prototyping, but, they often cast aside as a pixel pusher, the person that just sort of makes things look pretty. And for that, because of that culture, people seem to be stuck in all the processes. Developers, of course, don't care. They just want to code and they don't want to get involved in the nuances. And this experience is very prevalent. I've seen this over and over again, both working in startups, scale-ups, and enterprise companies. Uh, and it's just because of how fast UI UX has evolved. Uh, people have not been able to keep up simply. Um, I recently launched an Indie Hackers article on this topic. It, it, it was quite, it was highly valued by the community. In fact, the co-founder of Indie Hackers liked the post and it, it, got, it started getting bookmarked. Uh, it was seen as almost like a playbook for optimizing your UX process uh, for both startups and scale-ups. And 
a lot of people shared my the same sentiments I had about um, you know the fact that it's being underrated today. But what was really interesting is the opposing uh, kind of view, and the opposing view was that um, you know people felt that people didn't need to optimize the UIX process in the early stages. You know, if you're bootstrapping or starting up a business from scratch, um, this is not as important as let's say. Uh, you know, just trying to get something out there, you know, so in the name of getting something out there, people would kind of cut corners to get uh, to fast track the design. And my argument here is there's this false sense of scrappiness, right? So this person here said he's a designer, he doesn't agree with the idea of trying to, you know, optimize UIX because they have to iterate fast. And in the early days, you are scrappy uh, and you're 1.01 scale without major iteration adjustments, right? Now, I totally disagree. What if you have the tools and the resources? And what if today UIX design has evolved such that if you if you cut corners, you end up actually creating a, uh, a downward spiral for yourself and not being able to progress as you wish you could, and especially not benchmark against your competitors, not at the same right, uh, same rate uh, against your competitors who are very likely to be UI UX led uh, or design led. And so this false sense of scrappiness sh is, is a huge major issue and uh, why I think you, again, leads back to UIUX being completely underrated uh, industry-wide. Now, what's changed? Just to go into dial deep into what actually has impacted, you know, there used to be a sense of scrappiness and building things fast. What has changed? And it's, it is what I said earlier, Figma has changed the industry. Uh, if you go back pre-2010, UIUX was more development-led, right? And then Sketch came in 2010, which was the first pioneering tool, tool in UI UX design. And they made uh, a mark. They started to grow ex ex exponentially fast, uh, but exclusively as a Mac OS application. So it had kind of forced a lot of people to actually migrate from um, Windows to Mac OS just to use Sketch. In fact, those people, designers are migrating exclusively for that. And this was uh, a norm for quite a few years until Figma launched their cloud-based platform in 2016, Adobe soon after their cross-platform. But why is this important? Well, the fact that Mac OS, Sketch was Mac OS exclusive, Figma made it cloud-based, cross-platform, and also they made it a collaborative. So the first time in history, this phenomena of you know, stakeholders being able to come in your Figma file and collaborate with you, comment and participate in the design process. Designer, the designers for the first time were not left to their own devices. They were highly, uh, uh, the process is highly collaborative. People can comment and chat. And, uh, you know, there's a, a seamless handoff process as well. So Figma really changed the industry and created an all-in-one tool where you can both design your product and create uh, robust design systems and scale from there. Uh, and you can see how things have changed from 2016. You know, Figma has really innovated in this industry. We're going to cover things like component variants, interactive components, and high fidelity prototyping, those features, how fundamental those features are, and how they've completely flipped the industry on its back. But before I do get into this, you can notice that Sketch has been dropping down. Of course, Adobe XD is going to be no more if you've heard of Figma's exit with Adobe. So that is irrelevant uh, to today. But this is the future, guys, right? And leading into that, notice how this graph goes from red to green. And that's really important. Why? Because this shows, shows how the MVP model changed because of Figma's release. Now, if you look at the MVP model of the evolution of MVP previously, go back pre-2016, you could launch a SaaS product uh, that was just functional and that would be a great MVP and people would use it, people would buy it uh, and people, and then you could start to kind of get some early traction and start to grow it from there. Um, going bottom up is, is extremely difficult because it's very likely you'll have to redesign your entire platform from scratch and sometimes even change the tech stack. It's very painful. The new model, as we went post 2016, edging towards 2018, 19, the MVP model flipped. And this was um, a theory by Andrew Gargoyle, who is a, a SaaS expert in the onboarding space. Uh, the, the new MVP model that has evolved today is basically focusing on a, a, a key fact, uh, set of features that differentiates you in the market to make it functional, but also reliable, usable, and enjoyable. Uh, and what's really interesting is that both making it enjoyable, usable, and reliable has a huge impact on the UI uh, on, on UI UX. Uh, in fact, UI UX impacts these fundamental pillars. Without UI UX, you can't make it usable, enjoyable, and it also bleeds into the reliability. Uh, and so you could suddenly UI UX became uh, 
fundamental in the, uh, the, the, the scaling process for your MVP. Uh, now, if you can imagine scaling from here will be so much easier. If you have a strong base and your function, your, your product is already functional at the MVP stage and you're just simply adding features to it, it would be so much easier for you to grow and scale and push out features, right? And, and hit those uh, roadmap milestones and your growth targets. Um, this is something we experienced ourselves, and this is uh, has been a very painful process for us. We launched Glorify in 2019-20 with the older MVP model. It was functional and reliable, uh, but this resulted in this, I mean, effectively is a poor design process, which created an impact on our development process. There was, there was designs being shipped to the dev team with uh, poor clarity, static screens, nothing was granular, nothing was connected, delayed roadmap, delayed growth targets. Um, and what ended up happening is that as we started to scale and grow our product to the next next level, we realized we started hitting a glass ceiling where we're trying to push to make it more usable. But because of this old MVP model, we realized that you eventually hit a glass ceiling. You realize, wait a minute, the tech stack doesn't work with this model that we're trying to grow to extend its features. And the design hasn't been systemized enough to actually scale into new features. Uh, we had to redesign an entire design system so that we can uh, put, sh ship features a lot faster. Since redesigning our entire UI UX framework and the, 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 uh, the sourcing it from a robust scalable design system, making it crystal clear and documented, and then passing that to our dev team in a crystal clear dev process, uh, making the dev process crystal clear, the roadmap has been on time and the growth targets the targets have been easily and more fore forecasted. Um, building in this way is just much more scalable. And this is the new MVP model. If you're not pivoting to this new MVP model, then you will face a, a hard time kind of growing or scaling, uh, especially in terms of product. And of course, your growth targets are definitely pegged to a lot of um, your product milestones, right? Now, I want you guys to take a quick experiment. Go to Product Hunt today and just look at the sixth, uh, the top six products in the letterboard, you'll notice uh, something similar between all of them. All of them have exceptionally well-executed design, right? And sometimes, more often than not, you'll notice nowadays, you'll find one of the co-founding members is a UI UX designer that is um, uh, basically taking the role of a CPO or, or chief product manager. Uh, and this is really interesting how the market has shifted where you know designers are highly valued in the co-founder team now today. Oops, skip the slide. So the skippable has now also become unskippable. Now, previously you'd be able to skip accessibility and cross-platform and things like that. These things are must-have. Like you have to launch your MVP with accessible design so that people who are colorblind can see and read your application, you know, and this is being empathetic to the user end. Uh, and, you know, you need to make your platform cross-platform. It has to work on mobile. It has to work on desktop and iPad. It has to scale onto different window sizes on different screens. Uh, it you, It's very vital to have the dark mode and light mode to have that ex, uh, extension in terms of personalization. And why would you skip all of these things when Figma has made it super easy to execute? If you know the system behind it, you can execute it. And on top of all of this, there is a rise in global standards. Sorry guys. Um, yeah, so there's a rise in global standards. Um, you'll notice that our favorite platforms such as Gmail, Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all of them have major fa facelifts in the last three years, raising the bar, raising the expectations worldwide in our digital connected uh, community of human beings. Like everyone uses these platforms and it's safe to say that, uh, you know, with using these platforms, of course, um, you know, this becomes the golden standard, right? If people are used to in interacting with these platforms on a day-to-day -day basis, this will be the, the gold standard. And they want to see that same expectation translate on their other uh, um, kind of user experiences. Now, important to note, a lot of these platforms, I'm sure you would agree with me, and I'd love to hear you guys in the comments, uh, uh, you know, in get, answer this question, but a lot of these platforms were quite clunky, let's say three years back. Like if you look at Facebook pre 2017 was pretty clunky, even YouTube. YouTube just had a facelift a month ago, two months ago, they released the great latest version. Spotify, Gmail uh, had a major design system update in uh, I think about a year, year and a half ago. Um, so why are these things happening? Why is this rise of global standards happening? Because of the evolution it, within the last two years alone um, that Figma has been able to penetrate into the UI UX design market, making both designers accessible and the process better. 
Now let's put this in context to figure out, okay, what's the destructive domino effect? Now, because of this, because the industry has evolved within the space of two years alone, a lot of companies are lagging behind and we were one of those companies. And it, it only, all it takes is to fix a few things to make things a bit better uh, at your company. But first you have to get context in terms of um, how things, uh, you know, how, how, what a destructive domino effect looks like. And I want to know if you guys are experiencing this right now. So the destructive, destructive domino effect looks like this. You have pretty screens with minimal systemization. Designers go straight to knocking out pretty screens. And that's easy to do. You can find plenty of designers that can, that can uh, you know, create eye candy for you. It's, it's not hard, but there's poor dis systemization during the process, right? And that's the first domino effect. The next domino that drops down is the iteration process gets way more painful with time because of poor design systemization, because of poor iteration, um, because of a poor design station, you can't iterate at scale without spending weeks and months and days iterating with your designer. This is extremely painful. The design usage is not clear. So, you know, it's important to have design philosophy running through your entire design system. Like, why do you use a certain button color here? Why do you use a certain menu style over there on the right side or on the left? These things are um, fundamental UX practices, UX laws, if you like, that you have to create be behind your product philosophy. And if you don't create this, you don't create as clear user patterns. So your users will be confused. Um, you know, they want to, do, when a user enters your platform, you, you need to give them less than three seconds to figure out what they need to do next and take them through the process that they shouldn't have to uh, be handheld through every step, right? And so a more intuitive product is just is going to help with this and design usage helps with this. And most companies don't have clear design usage. One day a button is black, another day it's purple. Static screens with little clarity. This is another painful point where a lot of designers don't focus on the granular picture. They can give you static high-level screens and saying, well, this is the dashboard and this is your homepage and this is this feature A, feature B, and that's easy again. But you are now forced as a product leader, if you're a CEO, founder, a product owner, uh, you know, creative director, you know, liaison with the dev team or the CTO, you'll have to explain this in a granular way through huge documentation that takes weeks to create. Iteration on the code level is inevitable. This will happen. If you, things are not clear from the beginning on the design side, then your dev team ends up spending weeks building things in the wrong way or just simply missing things out. And no one likes to change things once code is written. It's, 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 it's a downward spiral for sure. Settling in the name of getting something out there. What you've you know you've run out of time, run out of money. You've you know, already wrote uh, your first version of your MVP, hoping that it's acceptable MVP. But you know how buggy and broken the experience is, and yet you have to get it out there because this was the culture of the 2010 to 2016 MVP model: just get something out there uh, and and then get feedback and improve it. But what if you can make you can put a stop to this and have a polished MVP from the beginning and delight your users instead? This leads to an uncertain future with an exhausted team. Your team revolves around your product, their energy, their, their positivity, their excitement, their rallying towards your vision. When you have an exhausted future, uh, when you have um, an exhausted team and users are coming back with both positive and negative feedback, they'll start requesting features because they do have shiny object syndrome, no doubt. The thought of going through that hassle, I'm sure will, for any team member will be such a nightmare, anyone in your team, in fact. And this is where you know the 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 you come to the end of the line, which is you are you can still progress with this model and it's fine. You can still hit different milestones, but you're essentially building a Frankenstein MVP. Uh, before you can even wrangle your team together to the next milestone, you've burnt out. You run out of cash. Uh, you start to question the purpose of your existence. Quite for quite frankly, and this is a painful experience that I encourage no one should ever have to go through. Now let's flip this and talk about the productive domino effect of an effective UI UX process. How does it work? Now, instead of building, the, relying on pretty a pretty screen designer with minimal systemization, you go, you take a stage-based approach, a UI UX design workflow, where you go from exploration, 
polished screen, screen flow design, publishing new components, and then a high fidelity prototype. It looks a little bit like this. Here's my process in our team. We start with a brainstorm session. We create a backlog. We explore the UI in a low fidelity or mid fidelity exploration. And once that's done, we start and we realize we polish the screens. We can start to create components. Components are reusable items for your Figma file. I'm going to cover that in a moment, so stick around. And then you ship a high fidelity prototype, a prototype that actually works like the real product. Iteration happens on the design design phase you can actually you run user tests with a with an act real prototype uh, and get feedback on figma on slack on loom uh, and then always go through this process and repeat and rinse it until you create a great mvp while every milestone can be then shipped to your front end design team you can document things as an optional step right and so we'll cover these things and th by the end of this we're going to actually give you uh, access to this framework with video explanations on how it works on a nuanced way now uh, in a more detailed way. All right, so the next step, iteration gets more painful with time. Now you have a scalable components library, right? Scalable components library will look something like this. You essentially have all of your buttons centralized and the use cases and how it works. You have all of the components available to quickly switch things. In fact, if I just pull one of these components like this button, since it's been systemized over here in this components library, I can go to the asset size on Figma, drag and drop this button, and I can customize this button. These have been technically customized by a UI UX designer with all these technical features to be able to switch from different button styles like ghost, or outlined. You can then also switch off and on icons. You can switch the icons itself. So there's this instant scalable way of design, being able to drag and drop buttons and customize them on the flow with really detailed documentation running through them and how the, how those those buttons function, where you use them and why you use them in those places. This is what a well-documented scalable design components library look like, uh, including the foundation, such as your color styles, uh, how, how accessible are colors? Can colorblind people see them? Does it pass the color contrast test? Where do you use certain typography? Where do you use your icon libraries and your grid system across your UI? Everything is highly documented so any designer can be onboarded uh, with efficiency. So you have basic and static components, but buttons, field drop downs, and it grows into an ever growing library in Figma. This is a highly important. Um, uh, uh, process inside your your workflow. Now, previously where design usage was not clear, like I said, you have clearly documented a design system explaining how everything works. Everything's tokenized. Your color styles are tokenized, giving you identifiers or IDs to re recognize colors that get shipped to your front end code so that if your designer decides one day to change color A, you can tell the dev team to change color A too and it changes across that scale. It's that efficient. Finally, you have static screens. Previously, you would have static screens with little clarity. Now, you have self-explained, explanatory, realistic, tactile prototype that really functions like the real, actual product. It gives dev teams a clear idea how, how things would work in real life. How does this look like? Well, if you see this prototype over here that I've built, that we've built, you'll see that like it works like the real product. The hover states, the clickable sections, you know, creating a list, typing a title. Um, opening certain menus, and dragging and dropping. This is the level of fidelity that Figma has allowed you to create with efficiency. So why would you skip all of these processes when you can build in this format? Uh, it seems redundant, right? Iteration on the code level is inevitable. If you previously to now, with this process, you can test and iterate your product before you code so that you're 100% sure before it reaches the dev team, you've gathered feedback, you've tested it, and you've iterated it before design so you can hand off with absolute clarity to dev teams. Now, you, instead of settling in the game of getting something out there in, with this previous outdated MVP model, you now have um, the new age MVP model, which is a polished MVP with far less bugs that's highly usable and highly enjoyable. Clear UIX process with a high fidelity prototype, your developers build with a thousand percent clarity, which truly reflects in the end product. An uncertain future with an exhausted team is no more. You now instead have an unstoppable team momentum because let's face it, how you build your product and how your pro team rallies around the product only is all completely relied on the quality of that product and the vision behind it. The better the quality, the better the vision, the more, more you can forecast, the more your team has belief in that vision, they will rally, they will see their hard work pay off, of course, with delighted users when you do launch, but they'll also rally towards your vision with fierce passion. 
a scalable MVP is what you want to aim for. This, this allows you to grow slowly yet sustainably, and you can forecast and success. Uh, you can for, now forecast success and raise that $3 million seed round at a super valuation. The framework, the way it works is um, the same document I shared with you earlier. You'll get access to this. Um, so do get access to the link in the comment section. And in the comment section, you will see uh, a link that you can sign up and we'll deliver the framework with you uh, within a week. Um, you can apply these techniques in-house and it'll truly optimize how you look at UI UX and optimize the pipeline, create that dev, dev to design alignment, and also inform you as uh, the founding team or product leadership team on to, to take part in the process and be aware of what the process looks like. Because all, all it takes, you don't have to know or be an expert in design, but you just have to know how the process works. And if you know how the process works, then you can manage it and you can uh, overlook it, right? Um, so this is what our workflow would look like. And we also have um, a Notion project board template, which will allow you to essentially create a benchmarks and an output calculator, allowing you to predict accurate timelines uh, for your UIX delivery so you can forecast business goals, right? Um, I'll show you a little preview of what that looks like. So here's a little project board that we have for uh, a project. And here you, you can see that uh, there's a board where your UI UX designer will work with you to, you know, if you have an in-house UI UX designer, they can go through this board and you, you'd you be encouraged to do a um, a granular sort of a scoping of the entire platform, figure out all the, uncover all the UI UX details. And once you've uncovered granular scope, you know, you create these task cards with all the granular scope, this will amount to in your done list, uh, it, will, it, it will amount to in your workflows under these uh, sum of all, right? So as your designer actually completes tasks through this project board and they release things on the done list, eventually what ends up happening is that there's a, a calculator that tallies up with the formula and based on the rate of completion of cards, we actually estimate how long will your, uh, your ETA be to complete the entire project, right? Based on all the granular scope that you've added in the task uh, section over here. So this is really important. This is really has been super pivotal for a lot of business owners. And we built this internally, right? On, on Notion directly. So the formula runs up, runs, and it tallies up the numbers and you get the figures up here. We have two rate of completion rates. So we have the card completion rate, which is as your designer finishes each task, the, the, the task rate will tally up and you'll get a month's left ETA to complete. So in this case, it's 1.2 months. And we also have a points completion rate. So each task card is given a scope based on the points, right? So you're, you work with your designer to figure out and a, a good designer with the, that understands the framework will be able to scope it accurately, right? And there's a framework behind that as well. And we'll give you the onboarding content for that. But if you're able to scope out the project in the granular way and give it a point, uh, a, a point, uh, um, a point figure or metric. You will then those numbers will then tally up to the top and actually reflect in the months left, eight, left ETA in terms of points. What's really interesting about this particular project is that this is a real project, and you can notice that the months left, left ETA and the cars left ETA are pretty similar. One point two months to complete, one point two months here, pretty bang on. So you got two levels of safety to predict ETAs both on points and cards, and they're pretty bang on, right? And so we'll give you the content on that to, to, to show you how it actually functions and how you can um, you know, get your team onboarded on that on this methodology. Highly, highly useful. Sourcing and vetting designers. This is really important in the framework. Um, you need to get the right designers. You either get two types of designers. You get pretty self-taught designers. You can, there are abundance of them in Dribbble, uh, but be careful, be aware. It's a facade of beautiful screens. Uh, without a scalable design system or UX principles. They just order takers and they just push pixels, right? Plenty of those guys around, but they're not going to help you succeed in terms of building a, a, a robust scalable design system workflow. What's important is you get a self-led UI UX designer. So these, this is someone that has deep knowledge of UX principles, laws of UX. There's a science behind UX, right? Uh, they have deep knowledge of the scalable design system and high fidelity prototyping, and they are super cross-functional across your team. They can work with the CTO, the CEO, the project manager, and taking all of those thoughts and processes and dissect them, um, you know, process them, and actually implement the, the, those that feedback in a in a in a, in a very um, uh, 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 strategic manner, so that they can execute the design process well. You find these individuals in, you know, if they've been educated through platforms like Memorize, UX Design Institute, or Figma, these are the places you want to go to to source these designers. 
However, one thing I would say is that we also, uh, if you know, if you guys want to skip this process, because there is a lot of vetting that needs to go through this, despite you sourcing designers from specific specific educational backgrounds, um, you might have a little bit of a struggle trying to find the right individuals because there's still a little bit of boot camping that might be need required. Um, and we've optimized these processes. We create a very robust process where we can actually um, speak, uh, get people on a call, boot camp them. Give them, run them a live test project, and really make sure and facilitate that they actually have the culture that they that you need to scale internally and uh, apply this framework that we shared with you. This service that I want to show you guys is Together.Design. Um, it allows you to get access to designers um, at with no zero hiring hassle, top quality production. Uh, the the, the uh, boot camp to execute high fidelity prototypes. There's, they require zero hand holding. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be overwhelmed by kind of micromanaging them. Uh, it's a fixed affordable rate. It's a, a UI UX, world-class UI UX designers for an aff affordable subscription. And we've got the whole kind of process um, built out to make it both 100% NDA, NDA binding uh, and as well as uh, optimizing, uh, you know, having the project management workflow so that there's some leadership there to actually manage them. Um, we do offer a one-week trial with this pl platform so you can... Uh, sign up to uh, directly to together.design. There's a, a, a call booking system that you can book a call with our team and you can get on the discovery call. We'll run through three things in the, within the first week. We'll have stylescapes. We'll have three sc screen prototyping and a foundational design system. So essentially exploring your style of your platform if it needs to be reimagined. Or, and we'll also create a high fidelity prototype, something that's tactile that you can feel and you can interact with. And then we'll also clean up your kind of uh, foundational design system so that you can grow from there and, and scale uh, at a fast pace. And then we'll present it to you guys. So that's what we are covering the free trial. If you're interested in that, then that that's definitely available. And without further ado, I want to invite Mark Pearson, our special guest, to talk about how to be investable in uh, economic downturn. So Mark Pearson, are you there, buddy? Hey, thank you, Omar. Very good presentation. Even I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be quite quick. I'm going to get to the point. Anyone that's on the call that has any questions now or during my part of the presentation, please throw them in the Q&A section because we'll definitely squeeze in some Q&A at the end. I'm just going to give you a very top level overview on my view and experience for you if you're interested in fundraising via angels, high net worths, VCs. Uh, to scale your business, but also I'll throw in some just common sense, just things that you should bring front of mind in an economy and a market like we have at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of uh, concerns ahead. The words recession, high inflation, they are all tough things for most businesses and you just need to be prepared for that. So I'm going to start at the very top and give you one or two minutes on my journey and experience, and then it will help you understand why I'm probably qualified to help answer some of these questions for you. So I've been an entrepreneur. I've been on the same or similar journey than you have. I've been going since a young age. I started off as a chef working for Gordon Ramsay and Claridge's. That was led on to me being a restaurateur at the age of 23, having my own restaurant and business. Then I turned digital and this is where it gets exciting. I got excited by the internet. I got excited by business and online and the scalability of that. And I started my own online business in 2006. That was a price comparison business. Uh, I didn't take any external funding. I self-funded it and bootstrapped to start that business and journey. And the business went on to be relatively successful. It grew and grew and grew into multi-millions of revenue, expanded into 10 countries. And that put me personally in the position to be able to start being an investor in other people's businesses. I did that. I ended up selling my business in 2014. And then I set up Fuel Ventures. And Fuel Ventures in the last six years has become one of the most active early stage VCs in the UK ecosystem. We've, we've made over 100 investments to date. Uh, we're really proud of what we do and the impact we have in the early stage space. So some of the bits of advice I'm going to tell you now are hopefully to excite you and polish you and just get the mindset ready for you to 
be successful if you want to go down the funding route. So the good news, the first good news is with all the doom and gloom out there, you know, you, you read articles, I'm reading about large down rounds, big unicorns being slashed by half price and all of the above. The good news is there's a lot of venture capital money out there. There's a lot of VCs out there. There's a lot of investors and there's a lot of dry powder. Dry powder is a lot of money in a lot of funds waiting to be deployed. The challenge is VCs, investors have been a lot more cautious. So they've continued to be cautious. I've still seen them being cautious up until now. I think Q1 and Q2 next year, I think they will be through the Christmas period and looking for new opportunities. So the window is now, it's a good time to go out. But VCs being cautious means they're being a lot more choosy, they're being a lot more selective. So you've just got to think about that, consider that and take counter decisions and counter choices to try and give yourself the best chance. If you put VC investment in the scale of things, only single digit percentage businesses actually go on to get venture capital funding. So it's not for everybody. It's not something you may want, you may, you may succeed at, but it's certainly worth going down that route. And there's a number of things you can do, especially in the kind of economic market we have now to improve your chances greatly. It boils down to some very, very simple things. So I was saying these things two, three, four years ago. So this is no different to where we are today in the, in the market conditions we have. Most VCs look for three words, very simple, team, traction, technology. So if they're technology and digital investors, they're gonna look at a team, that's you. If you're the founder, they're gonna to wanna to look at you. What are they gonna to wanna to see? Someone smart, someone that really understands their sector, their knowledge, expertise. They wanna see someone super hardworking. They wanna see someone ambitious. They wanna see someone with tenacity. They wanna see someone stand out from the crowd. This is why this design uh, session today is fascinating because that's probably the first thing. Remember, when you land in uh, a VC's inbox or however you message them, they're gonna see design is going to be the first you know they say you get the attention span for x amount of seconds that's the point for you to pop and stand out so all of the stuff we've just learned is very important so team if it's just you i was a solo founder you may it may just be you so how do you build a team it's a real chicken and egg situation you may already have an established team but you know a VC is looking that you have the ability to scale, ability to build a great business, a great big global business potentially. So how do you put together that team? Sometimes how do you put together that team with little to no money? And there's the real chicken and egg. Now you've got to be creative here. You know, when you're putting together a pitch deck or a presentation, you might have no money in the bank. You might have an early stage concept of an idea, but a VC is very rarely going to invest into a single person with a concept and idea. They're gonna to wanna to see some element of team uh, experience people. And you can go out there, you can have coffees, have online video calls, get to know people and think of what that team would look like. People might commit to your business, might commit to joining your idea and concept and venture way before you're even ready or funded. You can go on that journey together and you know, commit to it once we get funding, we're coming together. And I think the VCs will buy into that as a, stage if you're that pre-seed stage remember at fuel we'll still invest in individuals in our pre-seed fund so there's still an opportunity there don't think what i said write you off completely but do remember they're looking for a team or someone or individuals who are, have the ability to pull together a world-class team expertise knowledge experience in that sector you choose traction this is really important most VCs at all different stages, most of them look for traction. Traction can mean many different things. It normally means customers, users, revenue, or a mixture of all of the above. You know, I've seen traction looking like a contract. You know, there's no product built, but someone's sold something to someone with a commitment. That's traction, it's progress. So whatever traction looks like for you, the more you have of it, more things you can show, the more evidence you can show of 
interest in your business or progress made or success, that's going to give you much more chance to win the funding that you may go out to look for than others. And then technology, we're talking about product. We're talking about what have you got? What are you building? Have you started building it? Have you got an MVP in the market? Can people use it? How are you going to deliver it? Who's going to build it? All of the above. So think about that. Uh, make sure it's the best it can be. The version you have today might be perfection. I don't think anyone has perfection. It's always iterative, good, better, best, always trying to improve. But, you know, do think about them key things. Uh, another important area is sector. So the choice of sector is very, very important right now. So, you know, B2C businesses, consumer businesses are having a pretty hard time. You know, if you look out the window and you see the economy, you see inflation, you know, there's a lot of challenges out there. You know, households have less spend to, to, to spend on consumer goods. And that means for the next maybe year or two, I'm not the expert, but for the next year or two, at least, you're going to see consumer businesses struggle. Not all of them, but as a whole, they're not going to do as well as they have done in the previous couple of years. So VCs on the whole, not fully, that is not a given, but not on the whole, are a little bit cold or not as confident on consumer businesses. Whereas B2B, reoccurring revenues, something like this is really exciting. So, you know, pick a sector that could be maybe recession proof, maybe a bit more interesting for VCs. You know, VCs are medium long-term thinkers, but they're also going to think, how is this business going to do in the next year or two? So consider that when you go into it. Uh, one word I always use is, is your business a must-have? Or is it a nice to have? Now think about that. Uh, I always said this before uh, the coronavirus pandemic. I always said, is it a must have or a nice to have? And that hit really hard at home because some companies never lost any revenue because they were a must have. They were integrated. Their services were important. And all the nice to haves got cut and reduced and lost revenue. So think about your business and proposition. Does it tick that must have box? Is it doing something fundamentally good? Is it solving a problem? Is it, is it really needed? Is it integrated heavily? Is it saving the money? Whatever it may be. Now onto what I call good business. Just think like a healthy business person. Is your business a good business? Is it a healthy business? Think about return on investment. For every pound you spend, how much is coming out the other end? If it's less than a pound over medium long term, that's probably not a good business. The aim of the business is to make money. So think about what just the fundamentals of what a good business is. Low burn rate, that's quite important, especially in this market. No one wants to see a business burning lots of money, the cash dwindling and constantly making losses. That's okay in venture capital. It's okay to invest to grow. But what we don't want is massive burns and quite very high risk businesses. You know, low customer acquisition cost. Is, is music to investors' ears and, you know, high lifetime value it is really important. So if you can get a healthy business, remember, I'm just talking common sense here, but think of what VCs will want to see. It's not alien. Most of it's common sense. Uh, some mistakes I see founders make when they're going to, on the VC process. It means you've got to kiss a lot of frogs. By that, I mean you've got to talk to a lot of investors. You're going to pitch again and again and again and again. Mostly it's 40, 50 investors. If you're going to be successful at raising, let's say, a Series A, a, a three, four, five, six million pound round, you're going to have to kiss a lot of frogs. And during that, you can get tired. You can get lethargic. It can become rinse and repeat. You can get a bit bored. You can get frustrated. But what I've seen is founders start to get a little bit cocky, start to get a little bit short, start to get a little bit moody, a little bit snappy. And that is the ultimate. It's going to kill your process because if anyone gets a sense of that or feels it, it's going to instantly make it a no for you. And you don't want those. You want more interested on all the way. Look at a funnel all the way to the end. The more yeses you get, the more term sheets you get, the more successful you're going to be in this space. Also, don't get cocky. Don't get stupid or unrealistic when it comes to valuations. You know, I, I always advise all my portfolio companies, don't set the valuation. Get the investor interested in your business first, then have the conversation separate because they will help you set a price, uh, how much you want to raise and how much uh, 
your, the business needs to scale and grow will work out what the equity and what the valuation is. There's no quicker way to get lots of no's and wipe out that pipeline and funnel by just putting the price too high and going in really too cocky and just silly valuation. It will turn people off very quickly because they'll think you're unrealistic, especially in this market. A fair price, getting the investment your business needs is more important than getting lots of no's. Uh, and remember, it takes time to raise money. This isn't a quick overnight thing. It normally takes a month or two of proper planning, getting a data room ready, put all the information in one place, getting your presentation ready, really thinking about it, planning your forecast, your model, and then reaching out to investors, then having initial conversations, then having second and third conversations, providing answers, meeting their team, it's probably a two to three month process. And that may be short, two to three months, it might be longer than that. And to get your funding, it might be month four, month five, you know, you get a term sheet, then there's due diligence, then the cash comes in the bank. That can be a four to six months process. So it takes time, but for the right businesses, it can be really worth it. Because if you get the right funding and deploy it properly, you can really go on and accelerate beyond your competitors. So. Three last points from me. This is for VC businesses or any other businesses. Keep it lean, bootstrap. You know, think every, every pound in your bank that you save and, and retain. Uh, doesn't mean you don't grow, but just keep it lean. Don't overgrow. Don't hire too quickly, especially in a market like this. You know, grow slowly, but keep it lean. You can deliver great results on a really lean team. Uh, cash buffer. The world is volatile. There's a lot of unexpected things going on. Make sure you have a cash buffer in the bank. Don't let it get too tight because, you know, you can very quickly lose your business and things can happen very quickly. Think about a pandemic. You know, how many businesses weren't prepared for that? Think about it. Just always keep a good sensible buffer in the bank at all time and then think about customer concentration if you've got revenues and business you know you might be able to control this but think about it in the medium long term if you're reliant on one or two customers and you get some bad news or you lose a customer think of how that can impact you very very rapidly so try and diversify customers different revenue sources and all of the above so that was a whirlwind view on how to focus and get the best chance of getting funding in this space, but also just normal, healthy fundamentals of running a business. Guys, do you want to open up the floor for Q&A now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Mark and Omar, for giving us your time and giving us those, those great uh, those presentations. Um, definitely a lot to take on board. I'm glad I was making notes <laughs> for the both of you. <laughs> so yeah, so let's let's start off with with uh, with uh, questions. Um, oh, before before that, uh, everyone, make sure that you sign up for uh, for the um, the UX resources we're sharing out to everyone. Um, the links in the chat. So just make sure you click on that and and follow through. And um, if you've sent your LinkedIn already through, if you send your LinkedIn link through, uh, you should see a message from me uh, with that link. So okay, we'll start off with the Q and A. Um, the, the first question is from Sarah. Uh, how often should businesses have a facelift, bearing in mind the global uh, expectations? Um, I think this can go to both of you. Uh, Mark, if you want to go first. I didn't quite have the question repeated for me. So this is from Sarah. How often should businesses have a facelift, bearing in mind the global situation? A design angle, I'm sure. Uh, so, so I think... When it feels right, don't do it too often because it's a big project to get it right. Don't rush it. Uh, if you think it's needed, if you think it's really going to change the dial, if you can afford to put the effort into it, but it is really important. Sometimes it can be the thing that can win you business versus not. Omar's very much going to have a uh, much more better answer than me, Omar. No, I think Mark, you pretty much nailed it on the head. Uh, you know, it's just about, about, about making sense of it, right? Is it the right timing? more than anything and you know is there going to be roi can you predict roi at the end of that journey um i think for me it's more important more from the visual aesthetic side that i mean this whole kind of webinar is focused on design systemization and high fidelity prototyping uh if you're going to undergo a facelift make sure that that's your focus to make sure that you both systemize your your base and your foundation so that colors are accounted for components are accounted for so 
you then you can then scale your product much efficient much more efficiently. Um, if you do have a design system, the great news, like I said earlier, is that um, you can change aesthetics at scale. So if tomorrow you had a you have a new rebrand, then it's okay. You can just switch the colors up very 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 quickly with Figma's uh, resources. So um, so th I think the focus should be yeah a scalable design system if that's going to happen. Fantastic. Thank you very much as both of you. Uh, the next one uh, is to you, Mark. Uh, hi, <laughs> hi, Mark. What is the best way to send a pitch deck to Fuel Ventures and, and get any feedback? Um, we tried recently and got no response. Any pointers will be appreciated. Okay, uh, this is from okay. Good, fair question. Thank you. Uh, we get a lot of submissions. So let, I told you earlier that it's a numbers game, right? So probably each month we get 500 submissions. And I, I wow. think this year, this year, I think we probably invested in maybe 62 businesses. So, so you know, we can't invest in everything that moves. We do have a vigorous, fine process. I, I would say do submit via our web form online, fuel.ventures, you'll find the web form to submit. We do look at every single one of them. We have an auto response. We physically haven't got enough team to respond to everybody. So apologies for that. We do look at everyone and we'll reach out to you if it catches our attention. But also, we're not the only VC on the planet, right? So if I was you, put it in everyone's inbox and try your best because it's a numbers game. What we might like, someone else might like. And, you know, don't give up there. Honestly, don't give up there. Iterate and iterate. Keep on trying. You can also try other routes just because that's our web form. It doesn't mean you can't try and reach out to individuals. Use LinkedIn. You, if you've got their email, find their email. Use social media. Do what you want. It's better to get a no than not get in front of somebody. You know, if, if, if you're really pestering somebody, they'll say, sorry, it's not for me. You know, if you hear silence, you don't know if that's a no or not. So, so be persistent. You know, there's no harm in that. And, and also don't be afraid to iterate. I've seen uh, presentations or businesses that we didn't like at the beginning and the founder persisted. They continued. Sometimes they changed and evolved or, the, or proven the business. The business started to get traction. They submitted it six months, nine months, 12 months later, and it was a very different proposition. And then we had the meeting, you know, so never say never. Fantastic. It sounds like a, like a dating app is needed for investors and and, VC and uh, startups. There's a lot of swiping yeah. going on. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, if anyone, any entrepreneurs are here, have that for free. Uh, so this I one wanna, goes I want to extend that question if possible. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Mark, like how often is it, I mean, is it a better approach to like uh, um, have word of mouth con uh, 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 um, applications, for example, like so people that actually knows another business in the portfolio or knows yourself or a colleague or something? It, I, I put it as like an express way in, right? If, if someone we rate in our network, whether it's a founder that we've already invested in, whether it's someone we work closely with, whether it's another VC that we really respect, maybe they're a, an A round VC and we're a C VC. If someone like that sends us a presentation and it's not, it's not, oh, I've been asked to send this. It's because they actually think it's good. Oh, I've seen this. It's good. Not for us or we don't invest or whatever, but I think you should look at it. You know, it's going to get extra attention. Doesn't mean it will succeed, but it's going to get extra eyeballs. And that's the key thing. You know, your big vision might be brilliant. You know, just because you don't get yeses, it doesn't mean the VCs are right. The VCs can be wrong a lot. So don't let that dismiss or stop you ever going and doing that business. Honestly, VCs can be wrong a lot. They've been wrong a lot. I've been wrong a lot. So, you know, it's very, very hard to filter and choose what you think are going to be the winners. But yeah, persist via all routes, you know, be cheeky. There's no, until you, uh, you know, until, until you've been told, no, leave me alone, keep pushing. Makes sense. I guess there's a bit of a networking play there, which which is good. Like you can you can use that to advantage, and and I guess sometimes who you know could be helpful for sure. Uh, Magub, any more questions on your side? Yeah. So just some advice from uh, Kelvin. Uh, he said we use Notion for our pitch decks and just share the same link so they can update it. So everyone ha always has the latest version. So that's thanks for the advice, Kelvin. Um, from Sasha Visram, uh, how much experience, how much experience the experience, i.e. making sure you're seeing it through the user's eyes uh, and insight, do you need to have before you release the new UX? Um, can you repeat that question again, Magoo? So how much experience experience, uh, so making it from the user's eyes, 
do you have to have before you release the new user experience of the app or service? That's a good question. So, I mean, user experience or UX design is is all uh, it's always empathetic. It's always about the user. It's user centric. So, the process you should have is do tons of user research. So, when we whenever we make a decision on a on a UX level, we're looking at all our competitors, successful competitors, people that have done have made it significantly. And they, you know, don't try and reinvent the wheel. I've done this before, and it's it's really painful. If you over engineer things or you try to maybe too innovative it actually can be your downfall and we've suffered we've had bad we have many ux ui wins um but we've also had ux uh losses and the reason those losses come into place because we try to be too smart or too innovative you don't need to re reinvent the wheel improving the wheel is okay but take people borrow from each other all the time from other competitors other platforms you wouldn't have a figma today if it weren't for sketch for example because they pioneered the, that that kind of set of design tools but figma took so much from them and they become who they are today uh, so definitely borrow and try to have that mindset of improving the world but yeah definitely focus on uh, your uh, being empathetic towards the users the best way to be empathetic is talk to them speak to them uh, send um, what we like to do is use maze tours so maze.co a great platform you can actually create your high fidelity prototype on figma uh, launch it on maze and maze will send it or you can send it with a link to a sample user base and get feedback so you'll start to see heat maps and how they interacted with your platform before you decide to code it so that's i highly recommend that if you want to test your product and make sure that the experience is really driven user driven before you start to code it's very important to you know be sure about what goes to the coding stage um you know i've you don't want to suffer iterating on the code level always try to iterate on the design level and uh, throughout that entire process you want to be having a workflow of user research, uh, sending a prototype to sample user base, getting that feedback, iterating and repeat until you get it right and you're confident to release it into the dev uh, stage. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to say iterating the dev stage is expensive. So uh, I, uh, I want to encourage you to, to uh, encourage you against that. Uh, one question from Sasha. Uh, Hi, Mark. What is the optimal gross margin rate in early growth, uh, i.e. is single digit too low? Uh, I presume we're talking about a marketplace or some kind of platform business. Uh, it's funny. We've invested higher the better, higher the better, right? More course, margin, yeah. more profit. But that all isn't always possible in every business model. So we've invested in single digit percentage mar uh, margin marketplaces or platforms. And it really then depends on scale. Remember, we want to invest. You probably want to a business that can scale. So if it's a small margin business, it needs to be able to scale very quickly and very far to equals a smaller business with higher margin. So there's no right and wrong answer. It really depends on the business and the sector. And it really depends on your ability to grow and scale that business. That's what we're really interested in. Market size and can you grow it? Margin, a bit more flexible. I've seen small margin businesses go on and be very successful, you know, but you know, if it's a niche with a small margin, then you probably that's a difficult business. So just think about is it broad? Is it, can it really scale globally? And that's where the XXX zero multiple and size can come in. Thank you very much. That's a great answer. Um I think this one would be for you, Omar, from Charlie Oliver. At what point is a design process, in the design process, is it the most important to be disciplined? Um, do you want to give the, uh, them your context as a designer, Omar, your background as well? In what what, uh, what place, uh, so the, so the expertise a designer should have, especially a product-led yeah. designer, I'm assuming, a UIX-led designer, right? I'm assuming since the topic is UX. Yeah, we'll, of course, we'll yeah, that. for sure. So what, at what point in the design process is it most important to be disciplined? Yeah, I mean, you have to be disciplined throughout, for sure. I mean, um, if you're looking for specific skill sets within the process, they need to have they need to be self led. Um, I've I've gone through a very painful process hiring designers, hiring the wrong designers, and eventually finding the right designers. Um, I've been through a bit of a journey. One, one of the designers we hired uh, in the past uh, had a lot of leadership skills, but very poor execution skills. Right? Uh, he could he can come up with amazing ideas, and he would market them really well to the founding led team. But when it comes to actually sitting down and just doing the graph, like putting his head down and knocking it out screens, he just couldn't do it. There's so many delays, you know, and so. Uh, you know, we can't have the sort of one hit wonders or, you know, these people that just uh, speak on a high level, but can't execute. 
Um, and then, so it's a balance of both being able to have that leadership, but also being able to execute. On the other hand, we've recently hired designers that can literally put their head down and knock out screens for the entire week and 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 over over um, uh, uh, over deliver their from their their targets. You know, which is amazing. Um, and so it's just a balance of both leadership, being able to be visionary, have that kind of relationship with the co-founding team to, to, to absorb that vision and take that on themselves and then execute it on the design process for me is really important in terms of discipline. Um, but yeah, the discipline needs to reflect in the work process when it comes to actually putting pen to paper and actually knocking out screens. That's where it really starts to reflect because anyone come up with high and mighty ideas. Uh, but I think both of, both of these uh, components are still really important. Like they should have that innovative mindset as well and that kind of leadership skill too. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, another one from Matthew. I'm, I'm aware of time, so we'll keep the, we'll, we'll have one more question after this one. In regards to the reworked MVP model, what would you say to the argument that there is a huge amount of risk in developing what be, could be considered a non-critical uh, UI US a aspect before providing the core functional value proposition? Yeah, so the, in, when it comes to the the the, the kind of uh, evolved version of the MVP model, um, it actually facilitates uh, or, and and kind of avoids risk because what you're essentially focusing on is a focused set of features. But because of the evolution of tools that are available to you, you can now also make it functional, usable, and enjoyable, right? And so you don't have to skip those steps where in the past you know, the tools weren't available to reach those milestones from the beginning. Not only that, but from the beginning, you can make it scalable through a design system. Um, so as long as you start with a design system, and it doesn't take, it's not hard, it's not tedious. If you get the right designer, they can lay the grounds for you with, you know, foundational design system with their colors, typography components, your button components, all those kind of you know, basic elements and grow from there. As long as you know someone that understands scalable design systems, it'll take them a week to set the foundations. We take certainly a week just to set a basic foundation of design systems to then grow from there. And then once you have your foundations ready, uh, you can just keep scaling on top of that, right? And that becomes your MVP. Uh, but you don't have to, and, and in the future, if your MVP involves and let's say you change your entire aesthetic, that's okay because you can do it on the design system level and it changes that scale. So the new MVP model is ready to be executed because of the tools that are available and you don't have to cut corners in design anymore. Awesome. Thank you. And, and one last question from Kelvin, possibly the most important one for tonight. Omar, being a design expert, what is the better, what is better for, for conversions using photos of people or illustrations of people on your website? I think that's too subjective. It really <laughs> depends on the market, the tool, the platform. Uh, yeah. You just, I think, split test uh, the old uh, the technique that I think everyone knows about, you know, just A-B test, right? <laughs> send, send, send one to your sample user base and see how they react to it. Um, one thing we do as internally, we've, we've found useful, and this is a commonly practiced exercise that um, a lot of successful companies are utilized, is uh, just do a, a kind of ideal customer profile exercise, brand exercise or brand workshop, probably takes about half a day to accomplish. I recommend core. Uh, which is Jose Caber. Maybe Jose Caber invited him to this uh, webinar. He leads Core, which is a phenomenal branding product that uh, that is being used by a lot of uh, Fortune 5 companies and enterprise. Uh, it's a framework essentially to, you can take internally and execute a brand workshop to figure out who is your ideal customer profile. And based on that research, you'll know what to put on your landing page most often than not. Um, so for example, like we have we have good conversion on our website because we did this framework. So, you know, signups is not a problem for us uh, on, our, on our landing page. Um, so I do de definitely uh, recommend doing the core exercise. So look for it, it's called the core core framework. Um, I think it's hosted on the futures website, thefuture.com. That's without a E at the end. Magoob, you know the website. If you can yeah, drop that yeah. link down, utilize that framework. I think it'd be pretty useful for you to figure out those, you know, what design language to execute. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah. One last thing, sorry, Magoo, but if you don't, sometimes if you're not a practitioner in core, then you might, won't be able to maybe execute it by yourself without a creative, creative director in-house. So then you could, there's a lot of people that actually have learned the core framework to actually execute it for you. So you can find someone that, you know, has that specification or that skill set or set, is certified. Thank you, Omar. I put that link in the chat, everyone. Um, but yeah, that's all the questions that we have and that, that's all we have time for. So uh, I'd like to give 
say thank you to Mark and Omar for joining us and giving us their time. Uh, and one last thing, make sure you follow that link that I posted posted before uh, to get your free UX uh, framework that we're sending out at the end of the week to everyone. But yeah, again, thank you all for joining us and thank you for, for attending. All right. That's everything I think. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Thanks bye -bye. a lot, guys. Bye. Thank you.